Welcome back to Northwest City Politics in the Know with Juanita. We're glad that you're with us again this week for our show. We're very glad that there are people like you out there that are interested in what's happening in the cities in our area. Because it is important for good government that there's citizens that are following what's happening and letting their mayors and city council people know what they think and then that the there's a flow of information back and forth between those two groups and the city staff. So well, we're very glad that you're out there with us again tonight. If you haven't watched our show before, each week we'll have something on of one of the nine cities in Northwest Community Television's viewing area and learn about some of the issues that are current and up and coming in those, er in those cities. And we'll ask you, particularly if you're from Brooklyn Center tonight, that you take down our guest who is Mayor Tim Wilson, take down his phone number and his email and then you can be in contact with him if there's an issue that you want to share your ideas. So we're very glad to have you with us again. Mm -hmm. You've been with us many times. Yes, I have. It's always been right. joyful to right. be here. So. And, and we always learn lots of good mm -hmm. information about what's happening in your city. Yeah. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself in general to our audience okay. for the people that don't know you. Well, I'm Mayor Tim Wilson. I've been uh, uh, the mayor for now, this is my ninth year, my third ah, term. Ah, right, and, right. Um, when this term is finished, there will be a 12-year stretch, and I plan on running again ah, as well. Very so. good, very good. Well, see, we have an announcement on our there show, you right? Go. There you <laughs> that's go. good, a that's scoop. good. <laughs> All right, <laughs> got to do that once in a while. <laughs> and then I thought to give a, a little flavor of, of how city councils and staff get involved would we'll talk a little bit about Luther Automotive projects that mm -hmm. have happened in Brooklyn Center. Now what are the new dealerships and is, is it all Luther or is there somebody else? No it's all Luther. I thought so okay because yep. I wanted to make sure that I was saying it right that have been constructed over how many years and what what was their X and what's there now? Yeah there was two dealerships that they purchased when they first came okay. in. There are now seven. Ah, uh, so we're seven, a lot one of plant. Yes, yeah. absolutely. When Luther Organization first came in, um, their organization was telling us that cities don't generally or hadn't been generally okay. welcoming oh. uh, for new car sales huh. or used car sale places to come in. And we took the tack of, you know, well, we're going to welcome you on Brooklyn right. Center, you right. know, as we would any other business. And, and we did. Uh -huh. And, um, that has turned out very, very well. We have a very good community corporate uh, business there who works with our oh, city. Oh, right. Some of the places they have worked with us is the Cars for Heart site. Uh -huh. There was a small parcel there that the Luther organization okay. owned. They sold it to the uh -huh. city. It was a fairly good right. deal. Um, they donated 150000 to the amphitheater. Oh, wow. That's and significant. Yes. And every summer, they provide uniforms, equipment for the soccer teams ah. and the Little League baseball teams. Right. So they've been a very good corporate neighbor. Now, so. how long have they been building things or what's the time frame? Oh, they've... Roughly. They started maybe eight years ago, six years ago with that whole site. They okay. have... They currently have what used to be the gas station on the corner okay. on 69th and Brooklyn Boulevard. Um, they're going to put a Volkswagen dealership mm -hmm. in there, and that's in progress right now. Right. My understanding is that um, they like Brooklyn Center so much, and we like them so much, oh, so right. they've been very right. good, that uh, there are other things they're considering. And I always, <laughs> every time I see uh, Dave Luther, the owner, uh -huh. I uh, kind of give him a hard time and say, you know, if you have any other dealerships, uh -huh. and we can find some land <laughs> for you, bring them into Brooklyn right, Center. Right, right, so. right. They now are our highest taxpayer in the ah. city, and uh, like I said before, right, they've been very right. good. Very good. For well, and maybe you can talk a little bit how city staff or council members get involved in building this relationship because it's like more than just come to our city and then you do your own thing, mm -hmm. right? Yes, no, and that's a, there's an art for uh -huh. that uh, as well. But uh, this council and our city staff made it known to uh, that organization staff as well because when they came into the city, of course, they got to work with planning right. and zoning, right. that office, they've got to work with our city staff. Um, 
the council gets involved uh -huh. for approvals, planning and zoning gets uh, right. involved for approvals. So at every, all of those levels, we have made sure to uh, encourage and support not only the Luther organization, mm -hmm. but others oh, right, as right. well uh, that have come into this city. Another good example of a good corporate business uh, community member that we have is the Hyde organization that um, did the Jocelyn site. Oh, okay. Where Caribou is. Right. They also came in and we worked with them and encouraged right. them to. Right where the Northwest Racket oh, and Fitness right, Club was. Right, now right. there's an office complex and two big businesses yeah. in there. They're doing very well. And then the other one I mentioned on the end of Osceola Road uh -huh. or Brooklyn Boulevard, where they're going to put up uh, another office complex where mm -hmm. the Howell Fertilizer site is. Oh, right. That's all one mm -hmm. developer group who um, are experienced with sites that need uh, environmental ah, remediation. Right. But we've always encouraged them right. as well to come right. in. And because and, the, the business climate of a city is very important in keeping everything in balance, right? Yes, absolutely. For our little city of 30,000 people and about 8.2, 8.4 square miles uh -huh. or so, um, we have had a lot of redevelopment. Oh, you have. And if we count it up across the city, it's somewhere around $250 million. Ah. And that's very significant oh, for definitely, our community. Oh, definitely, definitely. So, yeah. Brings in jobs, right. brings in tax right. base, all of those things. A big plus. Yes. Yeah, and another area is where the Pep Boys site is. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see, that's on... Uh, Bass Lake Road. Bass Lake Road and 100. Kind of? Hundreds it's on one side, bit, right. Shingle Creek is on the right, other side. Right, right. Yeah. So, so people that don't know where that site is, yep. that we we're talking about it being a long range project. When did Brooklyn Center start talking about doing something with this area? Well, <laughs> that's called the Opportunity Site. Okay. Uh, it's had a couple of different names over okay. the years. But I know it was studied and I was on a commission when I was still in the uh -huh. planning and zoning. Uh, probably 15 years ago, and the county came in before that ah, and identified it right. as well as a, an opportunity site. And basically, it was land that's looked at that's underutilized. Ah. So everybody's aware of like the right. mall that's there, right. strip mall, um, where it hasn't been full capacity yeah, for, right, for right. just about forever, I think. Um, so the city had the opportunity to purchase that whole 32 acre site okay and we now have control of it we'll deconstruct it and we're working with developers to reconstruct it or mm -hmm. redevelop it as well Our, we're anticipating right now having better um, livable community in there uh -huh. where people can live and walk to oh, facilities right, right. And, and groceries and things like that we're also looking at maybe uh, a little more upscale housing ah. uh, than we have today and more right. uh, in the area of like um, professionals, ah. you know, in IT or, right. or middle right. management right. or whatever. Uh, it's one of the housing groups in the city that uh, we really don't have. Ah, we right. have we have almost 80% affordable housing. Oh, right. Which right. is great. We get new families in, right. we've got good housing stock. But holistically across the city, uh -huh. we don't have very much very right. high-end housing, uh, nor do we have much in that middle tier. Uh -huh. So, so that that can all move in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the city owning the land is one way to go about redevelopment. It is because then we can provide in incentives. We right. were talking about right. TIF right. money right. earlier, and if if we don't. We've taken the tack where we're not going to wait for a developer to come right. in and figure all the pieces out and try to right. do it themselves. We're going to be aggressive and work as much as we can to purchase properties and get right. redevelopment, right. spur redevelopment. And that's been kind of an underlying mm -hmm. process, which probably explains why your city is being so successful, yes. right? Yes, yes. It's a strategy. Right. It's paid off well, yes. So what determines when you look at a site that it's one that the city should purchase versus you should encourage somebody? First of all, cost. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's important. always dollars. Yeah, very, that's the important part. <laughs> yes, but there's other properties within the city that have been de uh, defined as underdeveloped 
underutilized properties uh -huh. uh, that we're not working with at the moment. Okay. If you look at where this 32 acres is, well, first of all, where Shinko Creek was, right. and then north where this 32 acres mm -hmm. is, where Pep Boys and uh, Rookdale Mall used right. to be, there's another set of properties farther north from that. Oh, on the other side of yes. 100, right? No, not no. on the other okay. side, just straight north. Okay. Where um, um, Kmart used to be. Oh, yes, you yes. You know, those, those strip oh, right. malls yeah. in there. Well, that's another series of properties in there that we have identified as uh, underutilized. Okay. Some place that in the future we hope to go to and uh -huh. redevelop as well. So at this point, we only have so many dollars, right. you know, that we can do to either purchase land or incentivize uh, uh, developers to come in and work with. Uh, but we've got the Shingle Creek one now pretty much completed huh? right. in its whole right. uh, aspect, at least from the city's point right. of view. So now we're going a little farther north, uh -huh. and in eight, ten years, maybe we'll go farther right. north yet. Right. So, yep. And it, and it takes a lot of work on your city staff's part, right? It does. Maybe you can refer a little bit to what, what kinds of things they have to do. They have to work with the properties that we have, mm -hmm. encourage developers to come in, and then negotiate with those developers ah. to say, you know, how can the city help you? Uh, and determine whether or not the city okay. should help them. Right, right. Uh, with TIF dollars and those types of things. One of the things that we hear a lot is where um, Jerry's New Market used to be. Uh -huh. There's a vacant property there. Well, the city doesn't own it. Okay. And we have approached the owner from time to time to mm -hmm. purchase it, uh, but it hasn't been on the market okay. and we haven't been able to do so. But people drive by there and they say, well, there's vacant land uh, right. that nothing's going on with. Well, yeah, it is. And yes, nothing's going on there but we don't have much control over right, either. Right, right. Once we get control of the land, uh -huh. then we can start making plans, so. Or a developer comes right. in and works with that owner, one of the two, so. Yeah, it's a, there's a, just so much behind the scenes that, that have to happen in yeah. order for those projects to move forward. So what's the next step in the Pep Boys process? Right you now. You own the land. Yep. And what's gonna happen in kind of what kind of time frame? Over the next year or so, um, there will be deconstruction. Okay. Everything will be torn down. It'll become uh, what they call brown land, okay. which means it's uh, redevelopment ready land ah. with no buildings on okay. it. So it's just it's sitting there ready. Um, as we're going through that deconstruction of that whole site, then we'll also continue to work with the redeveloper okay. um, to say this is kind of what we envision. Ah they will start doing studies uh, on what the market will bear. Right. So right. what what things can they develop there, uh, say a coffee store or, right. or something right. in that order, that the market will um, support. Oh, that's the important part too. Right? Yes, because they, they want to come in and they want to build and make a profit or at least break even on what right. they're doing, certainly not lose money. Oh, so, definitely. So. It, that and, gets to be a long, complicated process. And then, too. then also, there's the encouragement that cities do to encourage people to utilize the businesses that mm -hmm. have come to your city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, a fairly good website now that uh, staff has put together over the years, and we uh, put information there on businesses uh -huh. within our city. There's also a Brooklyn Center Business Association uh -huh. that works with all of the businesses as well and promotes our city. Uh, we have the Northwest uh, Minneapolis uh, Visitors Bureau uh -huh. that uh, I think I'm on, I'm on the board yet oh, for uh -huh. that one. And um, they promote our city also. So there's a lot of different facets. Right. And there's a lot of competition as well. Oh, I mean, there's, right. there's a number of first ring suburbs here right. um, that all kind of have the similar idea right. and are promoting their cities as well. So, yeah, And a, kind of a good example is when you got the FBI building, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Maybe give us a little scenario there of what happened. Oh, that was an interesting story. We, uh, our redevelopment specialist we were uh, talking about right. with the city. 
um, and I always tell it this way, I don't know if it's true or right. not, but he's thumbing through a magazine like uh -huh. Redevelopment R.S. Okay. or something, right. and he sees in there an article that says the federal government's looking at moving the Minneapolis FBI headquarters to a new location, uh -huh. and they're looking at building and stuff. And furthermore, he reads in there and he says they're kind of like a year and a half, two years down the uh -huh. road already doing all right. their studies and where they're going to put it. And they've got some tentative cities in mind uh -huh. and uh, they're talking to those cities. So we decided, well, we'll just call them up, right. see if they're interested in Brooklyn Center. Uh, there again, the council owned some land, right. the city owned some land that was available. And, um, they really didn't want to talk to us. Mm -hmm. They said, well, we're pretty far down the road right. in that whole process already. So then the uh, city manager and I and the redevelopment specialist, we sat down one day and said, well, what do you think they'll do if we offer them the land? Uh -huh. And the land was about 3.2 million right. at that time. So we called them back yeah. and offered them the land and it wasn't more than a week or two uh -huh. that GSA was out, the right, government right. arm of purchasing was out, and they were looking and talking to us. So we got through all of that, and they decide they're going to build there, they have a developer, and then they tell us you can't say anything for a year, <laughs> right, a whole right. year. We couldn't <laughs> say anything about it. <laughs> yes, right. yes. So here we have that vacant land, and nothing's going on, and nothing's going on. Well, eventually it got to right, the point right. where the federal government then announced that the FBI right. building was going there. So. so it was a real coup for your city staff. And, yes. And that those kinds of things are kind of an ongoing thing that, that are happening. And then you finally see the fruit of it. Yeah, and it takes time. Oh, it, it takes right, a lot of time, right. a lot of dollars. But that was the single most event that really spurred the redevelopment in Brooklyn oh, Center right, was the right. first major piece right. uh, that was redeveloped and it came into the city. We also at the very same time on Bass Lake Road did a beautification project along oh, that road. Oh yes, yes. Yep. And that uh, we found out had helped quite a bit uh -huh. as well with the developer in the Shingle Creek Crossing uh -huh. area because um, we had people looking at that property, uh, in fact they came a couple of um, redeveloper groups came up from uh -huh. Chicago, and their comment was, you know, how, how nice it right, looked to start right. with. Um, but at that time, they'd also heard that we had been working hard with crime mm -hmm. and those statistics. And uh, I have to say, crime is way oh, down. Oh, yes. Down. It's down like 40 to 50% yeah. in, in some of the neighborhoods. So. Now, I've been talking with other people from other cities. The Metropolitan Council is setting targets. I think it's something about 2030, right? Mm -hmm. is, is their slogan. But it's dealing with affordable housing in cities and that they're giving quotas to different cities of how much affordable housing they should get by 2030. Now, this action has brought some protests from your city, yeah. from Brooklyn Park, from uh, Richfield, I believe, Richfield, and, yeah. and probably some additional side ones, but particularly yep. those three cities. Maybe you can talk about what the concerns are and then what steps the, your cities are taking. Yeah, we have, uh, I'll start with the steps we're taking right. first. We have put together a suit um, that names Minneapolis, St. Paul, Metro Council, and HUD uh -huh. at the federal level right. to say that um, there's a disparity in how affordable housing is being built across the metro. Right. And basically that disparity is that first string suburbs like Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park, uh, Richfield, uh, those that are not as affluent. Right is where most of the affordable housing is being right, built. Right, right. And it hasn't always been that way. No. In the 80s and 90s, we were pretty good. We, we had good mm -hmm. separation across the whole metro. Um, but lately now, uh, the Met Council, when they do their planning environments, have not, in our opinion, right. kept up with that ratio. So we, and they have a very complicated point system. Right. But what happens is uh, most of that new housing is being built in the first string suburbs or in the downtowns right. like Minneapolis. Uh, uh, Brooklyn Center hasn't built one for a while and 
because <laughs> we're fully developed. Oh, right, right. And right now, even from Met Council's statistics, we're about 80% affordable housing right, already. Right, right. Uh, but when you start looking at the second ring suburbs uh -huh. and starting getting out farther where right. what they call the white flight has uh -huh. been, right. um, there's no affordable housing. Yeah, and that's the strange part, right? Yes, yes. We know, and we see it uh, as well, in our schools that um, all four school districts now are almost pretty much segregated. Right. People of color. Yeah. Uh, blacks, Asian, um, non-whites, basically. Uh -huh. And we know, and there's been more than a few studies that have been done to say that if you have a mixed group of kids in a school that come from affluent to poverty, right. that are mixed uh, races, right. you know, as well, that they all do better. Right. It, concentrating the poverty and the lower income people than in like Brooklyn Center uh -huh. in the school districts, that concentrates people of poverty right. who are not as affluent in those schools. Right. And those kids don't do so well. So, you know, okay. so. So the negative aspects with concentrating poverty have a wider effect than just the schools too. Mm -hmm, Maybe mm -hmm. you could talk a little bit to that. Yep, property taxes is a big one mm -hmm. because now your uh, property values start dropping right. because um, your neighborhoods start deteriorating. Mm -hmm. um, so you wind up with areas then that become uh, blighted um, basically right, right. Uh, because of uh, people just can't afford to keep their properties right. up and stuff. The ratio and um, the Met Council has a color-coded map okay. that defines in red areas of poverty uh, within Brooklyn Center, okay. per se, and other cities sure. as well. And when I look at that map, it's the whole Humboldt Avenue, the whole east side of the city, almost half the city, right. is designated as already ah. being a uh, location of uh, concentrated poverty. By the Met so, Council. By the Met yeah. Council, yes. So our part in the suit uh, has been to say Brooklyn Center isn't going to build any higher density okay. affordable housing. We've taken that tact for the last two comprehensive plans. Okay. Uh, and a comprehensive plan is done every oh, ten right. years. Oh, and, right. And it's done via... Yeah. Uh, you have to do it for the Met Council, right? Yes. 2010 was one, and then there was one in um, the 90s as well, 1990s. And I was part of both of those. Uh -huh. and, and the city's prevailing thought with those comprehensive plans is we have our share right. of affordable right. housing. And Met Council would always come back with, well, you should have higher densities, ah. or the downtown Minneapolis should have higher densities, and that's where the new construction should right. go. And we take the view of, you know, we want our residents and our citizens, first of all, to embrace diversity. Right. Uh, we want to see as little poverty as possible, mm -hmm. and we certainly don't want it concentrated in areas where individuals have to live in blighted oh, neighborhoods. Right, right. So we've taken that tack, we've joined Ridgefield right. in um, Brooklyn Park and bringing that to light. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One of the things that Met Council had in its plan and is still considering uh -huh. is when the blue line, the light rail, right. goes up the Botnam Boulevard, they have in their plan that, well, people of poverty uh, need transportation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you should locate um, the lower income housing mm. along okay. those lines. Well, if you look at that line, yeah. that's right through the first ring suburbs ah, again. Brooklyn Park, right, Brooklyn right, Center, right. Ridgefield. <laughs> kind of repeat. <laughs> yes. So now they're just, you know, perpetuating that right. whole uh, right. affordable housing thing and concentrating uh, you know that that lower income or people with poverty right. in, in right. certain areas. So what kind of factors do you think should be taken into consideration instead of what they're doing now in terms of affordable housing in the metro area? Well I think 
Met Council and HUD both have good programs in place okay. that need to be enforced. Mm -hmm. If they're enforced, you have oh. a fair distribution okay. of affordable housing and everybody does better across the metro right. then. Um, but they haven't, and that's part of the suit, they okay, haven't right. been following those rules like they did in the 80s and 90s. Oh, their own rules. Their own okay. rules, yeah, absolutely. And that tact had changed. So now that uh, with their complicated point system and how they uh, award monies for low income mm -hmm. to the developers, well, the point system comes out to be downtown Minneapolis uh -huh. or first ring suburbs. You get out in the second ring suburbs and it's almost uh -huh. zero for points. <laughs> yeah. and, right. uh, it's just it's just not, not a fair and equitable uh, um, algorithm that they right. have to do that. Right. So. And then just real briefly, you were telling me about there was a recent Supreme Court ruling mm -hmm. regarding Texas and HUD. How do you think this is might affect the whole process? Yeah, we, we have um, a professor at the University of Minnesota uh, in the law school, uh -huh. uh, Myron, um, oh, oh, I can't think of his um, last name now. But anyway, Oldfield. Yeah, yeah. He Orfield, excuse me. He has uh, studied this issue across the United States, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where it has occurred, and it's not only here in right, Minnesota. Right, right. Yeah, this uh, is not a one-time yeah. thing. And and you mentioned Texas. He has he knows the city in Texas that brought the suit, uh -huh. similar to what we're doing, right. and has compared what we have for housing densities to what they had. Right. They took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, yes, you're right. Ah. Uh, there's not a fair and equitable distribution of lower income uh -huh. housing. And it's almost identical to what we have ah. here in Brooklyn Center or the first string metro. Right, right. So we're going to continue with it. Uh, I was just in Washington about right. 10 days ago for a um, uh, Build One America right. summit. And that summit basically talked about affordable housing and how that fair and equitable distribution oh, should right, be. Oh, right, right. Um, um, Dr. Myron Orfield was there as well, right. who was one of the major speakers, but I met uh, people from HUD, uh, assistant directors. Uh -huh. I met the uh, investigator who is out of Chicago who's looking into right. what we're uh, uh, allegating for the suit and stuff. So. And there was a lot of people from across the United States ah. that were there that see the same right. issue. Well, I want to thank you yes. so much. <laughs> We've covered a lot of <laughs> lot of information on a lot of good things that are happening in your city. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate your coming with us and sharing all these ideas with our audience out there who now know a little bit more about what's happening in the city of Brooklyn Center. And then if you've got a past program that you're thinking of you didn't get to see, be sure to check our YouTube site because it'll be available there. Bye, and we'll see you next week.